ring this more often. It's very nice, very nice sound. Yeah, we should ring it all the time. <laughs> okay, okay, everyone. So let's uh, carry on uh, after getting all the pictures out of the way. Actually, that's always a dream. Pic all the pictures are never out of the way. There's always more pictures, uh, but uh, get some of the pictures out of the way. So now we can go on to the uh, Penu Pinda Penu Pindu Pamasutta. Uh, the simile of the lump of foam. And we have been looking so far at the uh, first three of the five khandas. Uh, yeah, the uh, idea of form, uh, appearance. We're looking at the feelings, good, bad, not good, bad, who knows, but good, bad, good, bad, neutral. Uh, and uh, then we have the perceptions. Uh, and now we come to the fourth one, which is the sankara, which uh, means uh, uh, essentially the will, intention, volition, uh, that's essentially what it comes down to. Uh, so we're going to see what the Buddha has to say about Sankaras. Uh, and uh, this is not, not a very nice simile, a simile which is kind of unusual. Uh, so it's worthwhile uh, uh, considering a little bit. Uh, so suppose there was a person in need of heartwood. Uh, wandering in search of heartwood, uh, they would take a sharp axe and enter a forest. Uh, there they'd see a big banana tree, straight and young and grown free of defects. They would cut it down at the base, uh, cut off the top, uh, and unroll the coiled sheets. Uh, but they wouldn't even find sapwood, uh, much less hardwood. A person with clear eyes would see it uh, and contemplate it, examining it carefully. Uh, and it would appear to them uh, as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. Uh, but what substance could there be in a banana tree? Uh? So this is the banana tree. Has anyone here ever cut down a banana tree before? Uh? You have cut down banana trees? Uh, yeah, no, yes, yeah, okay. You have, okay, good. Uh, I haven't, so I don't really know what they look like, but I, I, guess, uh, I guess there is no core. I guess that's the point. Uh, the sheaths and sheaths and sheaths, uh, yeah. So this is the uh, idea of the banana tree, yeah? And as you watch it, you see there's nothing, no, no essence to it, no core to it. And the word for core here, again, is sara. Sara is like the heartwood, yeah? And there's no core. Like Dhamma Sara Monastery in Perth is like the heartwood or the core or the essence of the Dhamma. It's a nice, nice name for a monastery, Dhamma Sara. And then comes the, uh, what this is the simile for, yeah? In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of choices, uh, or if you like, any kinds of intentions, uh, or if you like, any kind of will, uh, or any kind of volition. Uh, yeah, these are all kind of roughly the same meaning here. Yeah. And uh, you examine them carefully, uh, and they appear to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. Uh, but what substance uh, could there be in choices? Uh? So, when the Buddha says, for what substance could there be in choices, it sounds like obvious, yeah? Of course, there's no substance to choices. Uh, but that is not how it feels to most people. Uh, in fact, choices, uh, I would say, or intentions or the will, uh, is one of the most fundamental aspects of what it means to be a human being. Uh, yeah, if, I, if you ask someone what they are or who they are, uh, very often they will say, I am the agent. Uh, I am the doer. Uh, I am the creator. Uh, I'm the one who makes things, yeah? Almost everyone, any job you have, even just giving a Dhamma talk is an act of creation uh, where you try to bring across some kind of meaning, yeah? And you try to bring it up in a way which is a little bit different from what you heard before. Otherwise, it gets boring if you hear exactly the same thing every time. Uh, so that too is an act of kind of creation. Uh, when you go to work, regardless, I don't know what kind of work you have. I don't know if anyone here is an artist. Of course, people who are artists or musicians or whatever, they are very creative people uh, because that's what these things are about, creation. Uh, but any job uh, is creative. Uh, yeah, Every job, you have to get it done and you have to find ways of doing it uh, and you have to do it in a way which uh, uh, brings out the best uh, yeah, and kind of brings out the purpose of that job that you have to do. Uh, and if you are a Dhamma propagator, uh, like uh, some of the people here, uh, and trying to teach people Dhamma, uh, then again, you have to do it in a way that works. Uh, it's interesting. I think one of the biggest problems with Dhamma teaching around the world uh, is that very often we hold on to the old-fashioned ways of teaching Dhamma, teach it in the same way, uh, and we don't really 
reflect enough about what actually would work and what will um, you know, bring people around. We don't tell people that actually Dhamma, this is life. This is what there's about. This is not theory. This is not an addition to your life. This is life. Everything else is an addition. Your work is like, okay, you do work. Why do you work? Well, you work so you can survive. You work to get a salary. Yeah? But that is not what life is about. It adds to life. Family, family is nice, yeah? But family is only valuable insofar as you make something good out of it. Insofar as you bring up your children in a good way and give them some good values like Dhamma or whatever, then it has value. It has value in how you do it, but family as such is not really having it have any value. The value comes through the Dhamma. It comes through these practices. That's where it is. And so you try to make it living, try to make it real. And that, you know, that's great. We should, of course, do that. But there's a danger that you see that choice, that creativity as a core essence of who you are. I am the creative person. I'm the one who makes these things actually work. That is kind of the danger. We all like to be doers. We all like to be creative because it feels good to create something new. Yeah, and we put our sense of self into that. Uh, and so that's, this is why this is actually a very powerful teaching. Uh, the idea that as you unroll the sense of doing, uh, as you keep on uh, peeling off the layers, uh, you keep, like an onion, you go to the, try to go to the core. Uh, there is no core. Uh, there's nothing there. It's just empty inside, like a banana tree. Uh, maybe one of these, you can take me to see a banana tree one time. Uh, <laughs> that would be cool. Uh, yeah. Similar, okay, in some ways, okay. Make a basis, right? Okay, okay, cool. Okay, so maybe one of these days we can have a, have a what is it called, a field trip. And we can have a, <laughs> see what it is like, yeah. So, uh, yeah, but then, you know, if you, if you have a field trip, you have to make sure that you examine carefully, right? When we go on the field, what it says here. So we can't just kind of laugh and have a good time. Actually, it's good to have a laugh and a good time. You have to combine examining carefully with laughing and having a good time. Yeah. Anyway, see what happens then. And so this is the uh, kind of the idea here. So how do we, so how do we actually do this in practice? Uh, how do we uh, uncoil the banana tree in practice? How do we uncoil the mind? And uh, so, of course, and I've already mentioned this already, I'll mention it again. Uh, and uh, the idea is that in, as you do your meditation practice, uh, one of the main purposes of meditation is to become peaceful. Uh, and every time you become a bit more peaceful, uh, you are shedding a leaf of that banana tree here. Uh, yeah, why? Because peaceful means that you are letting go of some of the doing. Yeah? Less doing means the mind becomes more still and more peaceful. Yeah? And every time we become more peaceful, and one of the ways of thinking about the path of meditation is that the gradual descent into peace. Yeah? It's a gradual throwing off of the banana leaves, yeah? Yeah? one by one, the coils. Yeah? And as you eliminate them, yeah? You start to see it coming closer to the core, less and less. And as you do that, you start to realize that all this doing that you identified with actually is a problem. The less you do, the more peaceful you are, the more still the mind is, the more powerful you feel, the more complete you feel, the more you feel that you have given up something which is extraneous, that is not really required. You start to understand that this doing stuff is actually dukkha. It's a problem. You attached to it before, thinking you are the creative person in your life. And there is a degree of happiness in that. But now you start to understand the other side of the coin. Actually, it's nice to get rid of this. And so you keep on throwing off. You keep on going deeper and deeper in meditation. And the more you throw off of doing, the more peaceful you become, the more happy you are. Yeah? And you realize you don't need all this doing for your sense of identity to be actually still okay. You can still, you're still there. There's no doing happening here. And eventually comes the day when you enter finally a full state of samadhi here, where the mind is completely unified here, and there's no movement at all. Here. Yeah, the choices are completely gone. No more willing, no more intention, no more nothing. Actually, there's a bit of nothing here. There's a bit of nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing, nothing, you can still have the perception of nothingness, yeah? so there's still a bit of nothing there, huh? there's still a bit, bit of something as well, nothing is even further down the track, but anyway. And, but the choices can be completely gone, huh? and you can still have a perception huh? that you exist in a certain way, yeah? you can have a degree of sense of self related to the other things, huh? 
eventually go beyond that sense of self as well. But at least now you're reducing the sense of self uh, and you start to see this hollowness uh, of uh, choices. Uh, and uh, so this is, uh, this is actually very profound because uh, seeing the hollowness of choices means that a very large chunk of what you took yourself to be, a very large chunk of where the sense of the full sense of self resides. It resides in relation to choices. And so now you're getting very close to uh, uh, kind of seeing a deeper truth about what it is to be human or what it, not, what it is not to be human, rather, perhaps. So this is how this works, yeah. And you understand that the thing that you took to be a blessing turns out to be the opposite, uh, turns out to be a problem. This is kind of the discovery of these things, yeah. And uh, you see that as hollow, there's no self there. It was not important. Uh, it's something that is discardable. And when you discard it, you're actually much better off. Uh. So, um, what do you think? Maybe? Yeah? <laughs> you got to try that for yourself, yeah? you got to check it out uh, and see what happens in meditation. Uh, I think every one of you know already that when you become more peaceful in meditation, it feels really, really nice. Uh, so a little bit of giving up of the will of choices actually is a good thing. It's kind of obvious. Uh, just have to take it a bit further and see what happens. Uh. All right. So now we come to the very last of the five uh, khandhas. Uh, we come to the uh, Vijnana Kanda. This is the consciousness, the knowing, or the awareness. Um, and it goes as follows. Suppose a magician or their apprentice was to perform a magic trick at the crossroads. And a person with clear eyes would see it and contemplate it, examining it carefully. And it would appear to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in a magic trick? This is kind of extraordinary, isn't it? A magic trick, yeah. All right. In the same way, a mendicant sees and contemplates any kind of consciousness at all, past, future, or present, internal or external, coarse or fine, inferior or superior, near or far, examining it carefully. And it appears to them as completely void, hollow, and insubstantial. For what substance could there be in consciousness? What substance could there be in consciousness? Hmm. This is kind of, the whole world will tell you you're crazy if you said that, but the Buddha says, yeah, what substance could there be in consciousness? Buddha is kind of has a different view of reality. This is what is so interesting about this. So comparing consciousness to a magic trick, right? Isn't that extraordinary? Because, and the reason why it is so extraordinary is because if there is anything that we take to be the self or to take who we are, it is precisely consciousness. Yeah, the knowing, the awareness, the ability to have any kind of experience in the world, it comes via consciousness. And so here you're saying that consciousness itself it's like a magic trick. <laughs> it's hard to really grasp what is going on there. So why is it like a magic trick? And uh, it is a magic trick, and I suppose in one way, that first of all, it cannot exist by itself. I was saying yesterday about this idea of the two sheaths of reed. Yeah? Consciousness relies on Nama Rupa for its existence. And Nama Rupa, name and form, these are the qualities of individuality. So you have to have an individual for there to be consciousness. Uh, and it can only exist with other things. Uh, consciousness can never, never exist apart from those things. Uh, it is not a self-existing entity. Uh, it depends on other things. Uh, so it arises when uh, all these other things arise. Yeah? And it kind of comes with it. And it, when you try to kind of figure out what it is, uh, when you kind of make it weaker and weaker and weaker, you go to deeper and deeper samadhi, it kind of gradually just disappears, gradually disintegrates. Yeah, you go from the third jhana to the fourth jhana, there's less and less no knowing uh, left behind. You go to the immaterial attainments, and as you go through the immaterial attainments, yeah, the sphere of infinite space, the sphere of infinite consciousness, and then the sphere of nothingness. What is the sphere of nothingness anyway? It is the experience of nothingness. How can you experience nothingness? Well, this is kind of the point. Then you go beyond that. You go to the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. The perception of neither perception nor non-perception. 
And this is where consciousness almost is completely gone. It is so refined, you can't even contemplate the state because you don't really know what it is. You can't get your hand, proper handle on it. And then you go to the neva sanya na sanya ayatana. The, um, uh, sorry, the, uh, you go to the uh, uh, sanya, uh, sanya vidayata niroda, huh? the cessation of perception and feeling. Yeah? Yeah? And then you come out. Everything has ceased. Everything has come to an end. The magic trick has disappeared. Yeah? And so consciousness is like a magic trick. And you, it's kind of fascinating. You look at the world today, the way the world is trying to understand consciousness. Uh, and it's very hard. Yeah? People, science tries to grapple with consciousness, can't really understand it. Uh, they call it the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, it can't even define it properly. What does it actually mean? Well, in Buddhism, it's just the knowing, just the awareness. Uh, yeah. So it, it kind of seems like it's very intangible very hard to pin it down. And it only exists in conjunction with other things. It cannot exist apart from that. There's always an object, and it is the object that we know. The consciousness itself is kind of, in a sense, unknowable. It's just the awareness. What is just the awareness? Actually, it's just, it doesn't exist apart from objects. And that's why it is like a magic trick. You can't really pin it down. So a magic trick, yeah, it's, kind of, it's obviously the most... Uh, uh, hollow of all things, uh, insubstantial of all things. Uh, there's nothing behind the surface. Uh, so what kind of consciousness are we talking about here? And this is kind of, I think, a, an important point to consider here. Uh, what am I do? I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, yeah, so he, this is the definition of consciousness here. And this is a really important definition that you see in many places in the suttas. Uh, and we'll see it later on when we come to the Anatalakkana Sutta, the characteristics of non-self. Yeah? And you will see here, it says, all consciousness. Yeah? Sabban vinyana. Yeah? So that's inclusive of all. Yeah? All means nothing left out. That's what it means by definition. Yeah? All means there isn't any other kind of consciousness. Yeah? There isn't any kind of supernormal consciousness beyond the ordinary consciousness. All consciousness is included. All consciousness is a magic trick. All consciousness can come to an end. Whether past, future, present, internal, external, coarse, or fine, inferior, superior, near or far. So this is a very important point, this idea of all consciousness, because uh, it means that um, uh, once all consciousness is gone, it means all experience is gone, because consciousness is what makes the root thing that makes experience possible. Uh, and this is why this is so profound uh, and why it is so kind of hard to grasp. Uh, and for those of you who are beginners, uh, I apologize uh, because this is, uh, this is kind of profound. Yeah. So I hope you come back again later on because otherwise I will have failed at my duties uh, of teaching the Dhamma. So please come back just only out of compassion for me so I don't feel like a failure. <laughs> so um, that is the thing. Yeah. So these are the five khandas, the similes for them, their the hollowness, their insubstantiality. Yeah. And then we come to the results of seeing the five khandas in this way. So these are the results. Seeing this, a learned, noble disciple grows disillusioned with form. Disillusioned here could also be rendered as uh, averse, yeah? or it could be rendered as uh, uh, repelled by form. Yeah, it could be so. There's many possibilities. In other words, you don't you, you lose your interest and you turn in a different way. You turn away from form or appearance. The learned noble disciple is the person who is practicing the path. Yeah, who understands the Dhamma. So it's not just anyone, not just a random person on the street, but uh, someone who is actually trying. And so when you see all of this, you turn away from these things. Uh, you turn away from feeling. Yeah. You turn away from perception, you turn away from choices, yeah? from the mind, the will, all of these things, you turn away from it. Uh, you turn away from consciousness, you are disillusioned with it, you are averse to it, uh, you are repelled, lit literally like repelled by these things. Uh, why? Because you know that they are dukkha, they are a problem, uh, they are hollow, there's no self, uh, it is impermanent, it is unreliable, it is nothing to be held on to. Held on to. If you hold on to it, you're going to suffer. Huh? That's what you see here. Huh? And then when you are disillusioned, yeah, when you are repelled by these things, you turn in a different direction, desire fades away. Yeah? How can you 
desire that which you are repelled by. It's impossible. You can't desire that. So desire fades away. Huh? And desire fading away. This is like coming to the very end of path, of the path. This is tanha kaya. Tanha kaya, the ending of tanha, the ending of desire, the ending of craving. Yeah. And when desire fades away, you are freed. Yeah. This is the definition of freedom. No more desire. No more holding on to the things of the world. Yeah. Yeah, no more. The mind is liberated from the prison. Yeah. And this is the beautiful idea of being freed. Vimutti, vimutta means that you are you come out of the prison. So we come out of the prison. And when you come out of the prison, you know that you have been released. Yeah, it's not like you come out of the prison and you think, oh, yeah, where, where am I now? Am I still in prison or not? No, you know you are out of prison. Yeah, It's like when someone gets released from prison here in Malaysia. Do you know many people in prison? No? Don't know anyone in prison? Okay. Okay, so usually when they come out, yeah, they say, yay, out of prison. Yeah. Yeah, they know they're freed. Yes, they, there's no doubt about that. So. This is what happens. And that's my guess anyway. I've never seen anyone actually come out of prison, but I, I'm just guessing that's what they do now. Because prison is not nice, yeah? Is that, prison is not nice. Is that right? Usually people don't want to go to prison unless you are Ajahn Brahm. He says, please lock me up in prison. I've got too many duties in the world. Prison, yeah, would be great. Just kind of lock me up in a cell and uh, throw away the key and I can hang out in prison. That's kind of Ajahn Brahm's idea of fun, yeah? Being locked up in the prison cell here. But for most people, no. And the reason is, yeah, why is it that prison is bad? And it's a very simple answer to that one. It's because you don't want to be there. That's why it's bad. But if you want to be there, no problem. Yeah, then prison is great suddenly. And this is the point Adam Ram is making. Yeah, I want to be in prison. I mean, I can chillax and not do anything. So if you want to be there, prison is great. That's the only thing you have to do. So if you ever go to prison, if you ever make a bad mistake in life, or maybe someone... Uh, you know, says something about you, so you have to go to prison, even if you're innocent. Uh, want to be there? That's the trick. Yeah? And if you want to be there, you're okay. Yeah? Maybe you have a better time in prison than you had outside. Yeah? <laughs> you're freed now. No, I want to be in prison. Yeah? <laughs> so, but generally speaking, we don't like being in prison. And when then, when you are freed eventually, yeah? like you are in this case, you know that you are freed. Yeah? They understand. Yeah. Birth has come to an end. There's nothing more to be done. There's no return to any state of existence. This is what you understand when you come to the very end of the path. So uh, we are a little bit ahead of, us, of ourselves because we shouldn't really come to the end of the path quite yet. Because if we come to the end of the path too early, then there's nothing more to talk about. And then once everyone here is an arahant, then there's nothing more to do. <laughs> So that's the part of the issue. So, <laughs> anyway, so there you are. That's the Pena uh, Pindu Upam Sutta, Pena Pindu Upama Sutta. And let's do a little bit of meditation together. Okay, so. Uh, any uh, comments from anyone? No. Hi, Ajahn. Mm -hmm. um, could you seek to clarify um, the part where you mentioned that um, we cannot control our will, choices, and feelings, and um, however we can change our perception? Yeah. And also, um, how do we identify when when something happens to us, mm. it is a cause and condition, or um, whether we should exert a little bit more effort to make certain changes in uh -huh. life. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, uh, yeah. So it is. Um, uh, on the one hand, things are caused and conditioned, and we have limited effect on them. On the other hand, we can develop things like perceptions. It sounds like a contradiction, right? Uh, because uh, either something is caused and conditioned, uh, you can't do anything, uh, or you can develop it. But uh, it actually goes together, because uh, the fact that things uh, arise out of cause and conditions, uh, it means that in the present, uh, you are trapped by the past cause and conditions. 
Yeah, right now, what you are perceiving now depends on all the past coming together in the present. Yeah? And that is the kind of the trap, yeah, from the past cause and conditions, the past habits that we have, how you've grown up, and all of these kind of things coming together. Yeah? But uh, because you know that what you are now is a product of past cause and conditions, now you can create new cause and conditions for the future. Yeah. yeah? And those cause and conditions that you create for the future, one of those is the development of perceptions. Yeah? So you say to yourself, okay, if something happens to me that is unpleasant, okay, let me try to see this in a new way. Yeah? I'm seeing it as I'm, uh, you know, I understand the impermanence behind this, I understand the problem. You see the world kind of going wrong. You see something on TV you don't like. Okay, this is to be expected. Uh, yeah, the world is like this. The Buddha said, Vaya Dhamma Sankara, all conditioned things are have an end. They come to an end. Nothing is stable in the world. Uh, so I should expect these things. Uh, yeah. And then when you see that, you kind of start to turn in a different direction a little bit towards the spiritual path or whatever. Uh, so in a sense, in the present moment, there is uh, what we're feeling now. We can't really change uh, but the way we react to that feeling, the way we deal with it can change. Uh, and that will then create a new future uh, as a consequence. Uh, yeah, so that is kind of the first point. Uh, so in a sense, we feel what we feel, and then we also, uh, we also can change how, how things are. Uh, another thing that the Buddha said about this, which is kind of interesting, is the idea, he talks about two, the two darts of feeling. Uh, and so, for example, some feelings are, are unavoidable, like, you know, you pain, for example, pain in the body. Sometimes you can't avoid it, yeah, because it just that's what pain is. But what we can avoid is how we react to that pain. Yeah? So you can react to it with a lot of aversion and anger and ill will. No, I don't want this. Ah, this is terrible. Yeah? And you make it worse because of how you react with the mind. Yeah? Or, or you're going to say, okay, I have a body. Painful feelings sometimes will happen. No choice in the matter. That's just the nature of a body. Okay, so you're kind of more accepting. And through that acceptance, uh, you don't create the second dart. The second dart is the mental dart, which creates problems out of an existing problem. So you make it much, much worse by how we deal with it. Uh, so that was the first part of your question about the, um, uh, you know, how to, uh, how the fact that we are conditioned, uh, yeah, does not necessarily, still is possible to recondition things. Uh, can you repeat the second part again, please? Uh, of the question. Yeah. Uh, how do we identify? Um, yeah. How do we identify um, when, when, when something bad happens to us, yeah. that it is a cause and condition, or we need to exert a little bit of effort okay. to make things better? OK, OK. So, so in a sense, how do we just accept it? Uh, or, yeah. And when do we decide we should do something about it? Yeah. Okay. So when do we just accept? Yeah. Um, so uh, the uh, in, in general, uh, acceptance is good. Uh, uh, in general, the, the problem is often that the way we react, we react in the wrong way. We can always do something, but we tend to do things the wrong kind of thing. That is a problem. Uh, yeah. So we when we exert our uh, will, we exert our effort to try to change things. We're trying to change the wrong kind of thing, and that is a problem. So we should always exert something, yeah, but exert it in the right way. Yeah. So, for example, if someone treats you badly, yeah, the exertion very often is to get, or someone treats you badly, you get angry back. You get angry to the person. Yeah, You're treating me badly. How can you do that? That's the wrong kind of exertion. Yeah. That's where the problem arises. Yeah. So what you accept is that you accept that this person they are a human being, they have problems, everyone does stupid things every now and again, so you accept that part of it, uh, yeah? And then you ask yourself, how can I look at this differently so that I don't suffer as a consequence, uh, yeah? So the point is that instead of being angry back, uh, you look at how you can change your perception uh, so that actually you don't make a problem out of it, uh, yeah? That is kind of the critical thing. Uh. So uh, sometimes in life we just... Uh, uh, accept things, whatever is going on, and it's fine because you don't have much choice. One of the examples sometimes is pain in the body. You don't have much choice, like a pain in the body, and then you just kind of go, you know, you kind of go with the flow. Huh? At other times, you think about how can I perceive this in a different way, in a new way, so I don't create more problems for myself. Huh? Someone treats you badly, you think, actually, none of my business, yeah? It's their problem, huh? They are the ones who are doing bad things. They will have bad results in the future. They are trapped in their own stupid conditioning from the past. Actually, I should feel sorry for them. They are trapped in that conditioning, right? Actually, that's what I should do. Instead of getting angry, I should have compassion for this person. Ah, 
Then the kind of the penny drops, yes. Actually, there's a completely different way of looking at this. Uh, then you are doing something, but you're doing something useful. Huh? Yeah, you're looking at the situation in a new way. Huh? And that is kind of the critical thing here. Huh? So doing something means doing something that is useful, not just doing anything. Yeah? And uh, then, uh, then you're on the right track. And if there's nothing to be done, sometimes there's nothing to be done. Okay, then you shrug your shoulders and you carry on. Yeah, And you keep on coming to the BGF, the center is that. <laughs> something like that. Uh, yeah, okay. I think Ajahn, many a times, uh, in theory, it looks simple, but many a times the conditioning is too strong mm. uh, to the point that we feel that we are helpless or we are victims of the, the circumstances and the conditioning that we have. And I think that that's a follow-up from that is that how much of exertion do I need to make so that I, I, I need to get out of that? That you know, I mean, it's hard to see sometimes when yeah. we are we are we are especially with a very negative outcome of our, of our life, or even in a positive way. Yeah. We, 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 kind of, we kind of live that, that moment, and that moment seems like, that's it, I, I, have, I have absolute no control <laughs> over anything. It can yeah. lead to a, some kind of maybe helplessness uh, for, for some people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good point. Sometimes the conditioning is very strong, and it actually can be very hard not to react in a bad way sometimes. And so what we have to do is we have to, uh, condition yourself before the difficult situation arises. Uh, that's kind of the critical thing. We can't wait for the situation to arise, then it's often too late. Uh, and that's why you kind of come on these kind of retreats. This is an opportunity to recondition the mind a little bit. Uh, you come here, it teaches you to think differently. Uh, and then you take some of the lessons that you learn here, you bring them back, uh, and you keep on reflecting like that. Yeah? Not just when the problem arises, but at all times. Yeah? When you have a bit of spare time, you wake up in the morning, you think, yeah, I should have compassion for everyone in the world. Uh, everyone in the world is suffering. Everyone is trapped in the causes. If someone treats me badly today, okay, I'll see if I can have compassion instead. Uh, and so you build up these things over time, especially when the situation is not too difficult. Uh, and in this way, when the difficult situation arises, uh, you will be prepared or you will be more prepared. Uh, and then you will fail, yeah? And then when you fail, don't be hard on yourself, yeah? It's okay to fail. You can expect failure because conditioning is very deep. When you, have, when you fail, don't have compassion for the other person, have compassion for yourself because then you realize you too are trapped in your conditioning just like everyone else, yeah? And then you are really on the right track. So you try your best. If you fail, have compassion for yourself. Never be hard on yourself. Being hard on yourself is never really gonna solve anything. Yeah? And I think this is one of the biggest problems in the world. People are just too hard on themselves. And then there's no, uh, no way out very often. Yeah. <laughs>